Thanks for tuning in this week's online message. We're still in this commission series as we kind of push through all of these things. Um, today's a little bit different. Like last week, we ended on a command of tithing and kind of walking through what that looked like and the difference in tithes and offerings and some other things in that. But today, I really want to shift because we, we've talked about this idea of being commissioned. And um, I want to talk about how to share Jesus with people. Because I think sometimes we make it way more complicated than it has to be. You know, people who have given their life to Jesus know that we need to share the gospel with people. And it's usually an intimidating thing, but most people struggle to do that. And they, they struggle oftentimes because maybe it just makes them uncomfortable. I know that I've met people that feel unworthy to be able to share. Um, those who don't know how. Those who actually are ashamed that they know the Lord. And then there are those who, who just refuse, like they're just not going to do it. They're not going to be a part of it. They're not going to be pushing in those things. And last week we talked about being prepared to hear from the Lord. And is the idea that when we read God's word, that it's speaking to us directly. It's his word. So what does it mean to be prepared to hear him? Because I think it's really important for us, especially on today's message, to understand what that means. That means that you're focused and tuned into what he is saying. That when you receive it, that you reflect on your life, meaning that you compare God's word to how you are living or what you are doing, and then you take action in that, whatever that looks like. You change what you need to in your attitude, in your behavior, to reflect God's word and what God's word told us, what God himself is telling us. And so you, you have to change both, not just one. That's what it means to be prepared to hear and what to do with it once you hear it. I'm going to, to read a few, uh, a few scriptures on sharing uh, Jesus and like our commission because the, it really is about what we're commissioned to do. And I wanna tell a little story out of scripture where we get to see that, but then I wanna walk everybody through how it's not really that complicated because I want you to feel comfortable doing it. I want you to be able to bring the Lord to the table with anybody out there because it's our mission. That's what we've been commissioned to do. And the very first one is really based off of the anchor scripture for this, which is Matthew 28, 19. And that's the whole idea that we go therefore and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. So that's our role to be able to do that. We, we need to go make disciples. We need to share with people in our lives about who he is to be able to do that. That's important. That's not just, it's not just something we should do. Like we are commanded as his disciples to do that. Mark 16, 15 and 16 actually talks about how we go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. That's we have to let people know the difference in heaven and hell, the difference in the Lord and accepting the Lord in our life and what that means and how to do that. Because otherwise we're lost. There's people in this world that are lost, that are separated from the Lord. And it's our job. It's our commission. It's, it's our privilege to be able to share what the Lord has done for us. And it's really important for us to be able to do that. It leads us to one of my favorite scriptures, Acts 1.8 but you will receive power in the Holy Spirit. That's how we do it. Like once we're saved, once we've been commissioned, once we step out and do that, we get the power of the Holy Spirit in us to come upon us, it says, that we might be his witnesses, the Lord's witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the all parts of the world. Now, this is a little bit different scripture here that I don't think everybody understands. Like when you look at this in Jerusalem, when this was spoke to the people in Jerusalem, like that was their city. That was their place. That was their neighborhood. That was their community. Think about like your Jerusalem, your community, your place where God has commissioned you to share the gospel. But then he says that we also need to be witnesses in Judea. When you look at what Judea is, that was the hill country. That was, that was like uh, our surrounding cities. That was like our state that we should be. So basically, wherever we go outside of our place, we need to be able to do that. But the next one is the most interesting. It says also into Samaria. You know, for the Jews, the Samaria uh, was a hated place. 
And so the Lord is also saying we need to be his witnesses in the places we don't want to go, in the places we don't want to be with the people that maybe we don't want to spend our time with. He's still saying that we need to go to those places and be his witness. And then he says, even to the utmost parts, the most remote, to some, some verses, versions say the ends of the earth. Here in, here in about five weeks, my wife and I were actually going on a mission trip to Kenya. And so this is a part of that. Like we are going to go completely on the other side of the earth for us to do this very thing, to be his witness, to be able to be a part of that. Why do we need to do this? If you look at Acts 2.39, it talks about that it is a promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. We do this so that those who don't know him, especially our children and our children's children, they learn about the Lord and they give their life to the Lord. But that also goes to those who aren't a part of our family, those that we run into at the supermarket, the gas station, along the way, the people we work with, the people that we, we spend time with that don't know the Lord. These are all places for us to be able to do that. You know, we have actually, a, there's, there's a great example in Acts 8, and I'm not going to read it to you here today, but this is the story of Philip. And Philip is outside of Jerusalem, and, and essentially he's, he's hanging out there, and he, he was in Samaria, as a, as a regent at this time. Um, and he started really proclaiming Christ to all of them. Well, while he is there, um, he's preaching the good news, the kingdom of God, what Jesus did, dying on the cross, being resurrected three days later, dying for our sins. And people were becoming saved. Like they were, they were believing in their hearts. They were asking to be baptized. They were changing their life in this this transformation that comes from the surrender of a person's life to Jesus. And what we see here is when a person gives their life to Jesus, they, they surrender to truly follow him. In scripture, the very next things that are asked of us as believers is the next step of getting baptized. So, so if you've given and surrendered your life to Jesus, but you haven't been baptized, that is something that's asked of you to be able to do. Um, he talks about this idea of sharing the gospel. You know, it's important for us to share the gospel because we need to listen to the Holy Spirit inside of us to hear the Holy Spirit. We have to be prepared. Like I talked about, are you prepared to hear from him, to be ready to react? It's, it's the same preparedness in our life as preparing when we read his word. Are we prepared when we read the Bible to hear specifically God's word to us? in what we have going on. We need to be prepared in that. So then once we hear it, we need to act on it. And so the more you read in Acts 8, you'll actually get to a place where an angel shows up and visits, visits Philip. And when he visits him, he asks him, he says, I want you to go up to Jerusalem to Gaza. And so uh, this was a desert road that he ends up taking. And he goes all the way up there. And on his way, he runs into an Ethiopian eunuch that is on the way. And this is not just any Ethiopian. This, this particular Ethiopian is like a court official to the queen. That means that they're in charge of all of her treasure. And so that's important for us to understand because this would be a trusted person. And he was going to actually worship in Jerusalem while he was there. And on his way, he was reading from the, the writings of the prophet Isaiah. And so the spirit said to Philip, so Philip went because the angel said, and while he's there, he's waiting and listening to the Holy Spirit to speak to him. And the spirit says, go up and join the chariot. So in that moment, Philip runs up alongside and he actually hears the, the Ethiopian reading from the scriptures. And he asks him, do you understand what it is you're reading? And this, is what, this was the man's response. He says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Now think about that concept when we're trying to share Jesus. Like if we just give them a Bible, like that's not going to really help their cause. Reason being is I'm going to read you the passage that he was reading in that as, as an Ethiopian. He says, this was the scripture he was reading. It says, he was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. Now, if you just give that to someone 
and they're expected to understand it. They're expected to know what it means. Like, we, we're not helping. It takes someone to come alongside and guide. This is why it's so important for us to disciple people because in discipleship, we're helping them understand. We're helping them learn. We're helping them grasp the concept of who Jesus is and how to follow him. And so as you continue to read in the rest of, of Acts 8, you'll actually see where, where Philip comes alongside and kind of does that. The, the Ethiopian actually says, here, hop up and sit with me and, and let's go through this. And so they do that. He kind of explains that to him. And along the way, all of a sudden there's water. He says, look, there's water. Is there any reason that I could not be baptized? And this is what I really want you to focus on while we, we talk about sharing Jesus here today. Because this is what this is what he says. Philip said, if you believe in your heart, you may. You have to believe in your heart. And we're going to get to a little bit more of that here in a little bit. And this is what this is what the Ethiopian said. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, that is, that is the most important part. So they stopped. Philip got out. If you read the rest of the story, he baptizes the Ethiopian, and literally the, the Spirit of the Lord snatches Philip away, and he's gone. He never sees him again. And the guy goes on just praising, rejoicing, and worshiping the Lord because of what happened. So let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be a Philip? Are you willing to to engage. What I mean by that is, is, are you ready and willing to share the gospel just like Philip did in that story? I can remember the first time that I shared the gospel. I was so nervous. It was terrible. It was terrible. And I fumbled through it. I fumbled through uh, explaining who Jesus was and what he had done for me. I, I fumbled through the prayer. And, and I have no idea how it worked other than the Lord himself filled my gaps. But uh, that young man gave his life to Christ then. And it was really amazing because not only did he give his life to Christ, but he carried on through the youth group that I was a part of at the time. And, and he grew. And he, you could see him change his life to reflect more of Jesus in it. And it was absolutely amazing. I remember here a few months ago sharing uh, with a lady that needed a ride. My wife was going to give this lady a ride, and I just went with her. And on the, on the drive, um, I, I shared the whole gospel with her. And I asked her, I said, well, what do you believe? And she said, well, I, I believe uh, that if I'm nice enough, that I'll, I'll be okay and I'll go to heaven. And she wouldn't receive any more else. And that breaks my heart because here I put it on the table of what it takes. But her understanding and her belief doesn't have room for surrendering her life to Jesus. And hopefully... Other people will come into her life because I haven't had the opportunity to share with her again that will reinforce to give her the opportunity to receive that. But just because we share doesn't mean everybody does. And then here last summer we had a VBS and this young man was really, really like working in it and trying to figure it out. And one night in kids club, we just we just shared the gospel with him. I said, have you ever given your life? Well, no. Do you want to? Yes. And walk him through all the steps, the same steps I'm going to walk you through here in just a minute to make it so uncomplicated for you. And he said, yes, and we celebrate that he has given his life to Christ here today. You know, not every time we share are we going to get that result. And it's important for us to understand that, but that should not keep us from sharing. Because it is not us that does the saving. It is the acceptance of Jesus Christ in the person's life that allows them to become a child of God. And so, I, I'll be honest, I actually have learned more about sharing Christ through working with teenagers. We used to go to uh, Dare to Share conferences, and that was what they were all about. They would, they would equip the kids with ways to share the gospel at school. And man, it, it was so great, and it was so amazing. I just gleaned those and used them in my own life to be able to do that. I mean, you could do things like the Romans Road. You can... You can do it like there's things with uh, every finger on your on your hand and you walk them through it. Um, I, some of the girls at our church do gospel bracelets and, and each tie, each color represents uh, the walking through the good news. So someone can have salvation in a bracelet. But there's all kinds of ways. I just want to give you a way 
to understand that we can do in our life that's not complicated for people to accept Jesus in their life. And so there's, there's just four steps here I want to share with you. And the first one is to tell them about God's plan. Well, what is God's plan? God's plan is peace and life. An eternal peace that we can only get in our Lord Jesus Christ and life eternal with him. It's that God loves you. But people need to know God loves them. And we need to tell them that. He wants, he wants them to experience this peace and this life that he offers. And most people I share with are struggling. And, and so they want something else in life. And so to share with them what God has done in my life, like ultimately sharing with them his plan, that they he has a purpose for everyone. He has a purpose for me. He has a purpose for them. You know, that's, this is where John 3.16 comes in. Like the most known verse in all of the Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. We didn't even explain that kind of love to them. That means he has a plan, not just for me, but for them. But to be in that plan, to be a part of that plan, you have to give your life to him. And so we also have to share the next step, which is ultimately the problem. Share the problem, or what is the problem? The problem is our separation from God. You know, being at peace with God is not automatic. We have to fight for that by our nature, by our very makeup. Like we have a sin nature that we naturally, Scripture calls it, incline, which is like lean in. We incline to sin in our life. We incline to that separation, and we all are born separated from him. People who don't know the Lord is what we call lost. We've all been lost. We were all just as lost as them until we found the Lord, and until he was ultimately revealed to us to make a decision in our life. And the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, God is holy. Like, he's perfect, but we are human. What that means is we, we, we've already messed up. So we can't hold up to his perfect standard. So when we are lost, we are like people driving 100 miles an hour at the edge of the Grand Canyon, not knowing there's a canyon there, and not ultimately caring. But we can't see the edge. And so we, we don't even know it's there. We need to understand that there's a ledge. People need to understand that, that there's a point that we go over, that we are sinful. And we have to understand what the weight and the gravity of that sin really is, which Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. If we keep going down that road of being lost, then we, we ultimately stay lost. And we don't want to stay lost. We don't want people to stay lost. We want them to know about the good news and what Jesus does. And if we stay in the sin and separation from God, there is only hell without Jesus. And that's not where we want anybody to go. Which is why we want them to get to the third step, which is to talk about God's remedy. What is the remedy? The cross. The cross is everything. Often we're quick to tell people what they're doing wrong or what they should stop doing or what they should start doing. But we sometimes forget to tell people about the remedy. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, we had a local YWAM base, which is Youth with a Missions. And these bases were basically uh, like, a, like a nine month school for people who wanted to go on mission to learn to be a missionary and a disciple. And then they would go on mission for like three to six months. And uh, we had one of those close to our church. So they would come in and help me with youth group and then we'd give them opportunities to share. And this one young lady, like she shared this amazing horrible testimony all at the same time. And what I mean by horrible is her life was hard. Like she she had abuse issues. She had struggles. She didn't have family support. Like she was homeless at one time. All these things came up and it was like edge of your seat, like your heart hurt, but you were so ready for what God did in her life. And she got to the end of the story and she forgot the remedy. She forgot to share the victory of Christ rescuing her in that stuff. See, people need to know how to remedy the problem. 
we can talk about all the things that are bad, all the things that are wrong, all the things that have been hard, but they're meaningless without the Lord and his victory in our life. God's love bridges the gap of that separation in our life. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he rose three days later from the grave, he paid the penalty for our sins. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, 24, he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And what Jesus did for us re requires a response from us. And you give one no matter what. When you, when you are offered the invitation to accept Jesus, you give a response. You give a response to receive Christ or to reject him. And our hope is, step four, to offer that invitation and they receive Christ. Because once they do, the cross bridges into the family. And when you accept Christ's free gift of salvation, the Bible tells us in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So once we do that, people are like, oh yeah, they said yes and they go. And there's a lot of people in this world that will, will judge that. Well, I don't see any fruit in their life. I don't see they've changed anything. I don't see them living any kind of life that I think they should be living. And I just want to clear up what it means to accept <clears throat> Jesus Christ in a person's life. There's four things that ultimately need to happen. One, the person needs to admit that they're a sinner. There has to be the realization that they have sinned, uh, that they need a savior, and they need, the second thing is there has to be an asking of forgiveness. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. And there has to be a willingness in us to turn from our sin, to get away from the things in our life that separate us from God. We have to do those. The third thing we have to do is believe that Christ was the son of God, died on the cross, and was raised three days later. We have to believe that. And the last thing is to receive Christ. <clears throat> we have to believe it, not just in our mind, but truly in our soul. And that soul connection ultimately creates a life transformed. Us changing our life because of what he's done in that realization to be more like him. And, and it's said best in Romans 10, verses 5 through 13. So I'm going to read this whole scripture to you here first. It says, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up. From the dead but what does it say the word is near you it is in your mouth and in your heart that is the message concerning faith that we proclaim that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if the word is in your mouth and in your heart, and let me explain what that means. In our mouth, it means we know it in our head, we speak of it. Not just one time, not just a single confession, but all the days of our life, like Deuteronomy 6, we speak of him because he is our life. He is a, he's in our life. He is the center of our life, and we are changed because of him. So we speak of him to our children and our children's children along the road when we rise in the morning, when we go to bed at night, that he is our life. And it should be coming off of our lips. Let me ask you this. 
Did you speak of the Lord to anyone this week? And as for the heart, this is where it sinks in to who we really are. Because scripture tells us, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of here is a direct reflection of what we truly believe. So if we're, we're the first Bible that people read, like I said a few weeks ago, um, what are you showing people this week about Jesus? What of God's word are you bringing to the table with him? Because if you want people to believe, then we have to become. Like, we have to truly believe. They have to truly believe. So what does that mean to, to truly believe? It's transformation in our life. If you read in Romans chapter 12, the very first scripture uh, verse of that, it talks about not conforming to the world. We don't want to become like the world. We want to look different. We want to act different. We want to think different. We want to be different because we have been transformed in here, which affects our actions, our words, and our thoughts. And so how do we do that? Well, the rest of that scripture says, by the renewing of our mind. Here is directly connected to here. And it's important for us to understand because God's very own words, it's by hearing the Bible, his very own words, speaking directly to us and changing our lives because we truly believe. So when I talked about hearing God's word in a way that we are ready and God is speaking us directly, comparing, or like ultimately comparing those to the way we live and shift where we need to shift, how we think, how we speak, how we act, and how we believe. It's changing our life because we truly, truly believe. And when you truly believe, you read it with the intention to learn, to grow, and a willingness to change, to reflect that love of Jesus in your life. And so you gain confidence in sharing. You ultimately find your story in the story of the Lord. How many people do you know right now that's involved in your life all of their story? How many people in your in your sphere of influence know your story? Because you, you can't tell Jesus' story, the good news, the gospel, if you're not a part of that story. And that's my prayer for everyone, that you realize that you have a part in this story, that you find it, that you know it, and that you share it because there is no greater evidence in sharing the gospel than the life changing grace and power of Jesus Christ in your own life. And may God bless you for that. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in thanks and gratitude for your hand in our life, for your son dying on the cross. And Lord, help us to be confident, help us to be bold, help us to know the words to share with those that we come in contact us to share the gospel with them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July week and a safe one, and we will see you next time.